Today we're going to continue to jump right into the text and pick up where we've left off. We're almost at the end of the book of Acts, believe it or not, just a few chapters away from being finished with this book that we started a while back, but as we've been going through it, what a wonderful picture of God's grace, reminding us that he takes people, he brings people who were lost in sin and rebellion against him. He redeems them by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and then calls on them, calls on us to share the message of the gospel of Jesus with the world. This is the call that we talked about last week, the call that every believer has, a call that God helps us by his strength, by his power to fulfill that no matter who we are or what we've been through or what we are going through or what we will go through, for those who are believers of Jesus Christ, God has given us the call to share the message of Jesus Christ and his love. And then he strengthens us. He makes it possible for us to do so. It wasn't just for the 12 disciples. It wasn't just for the apostles. It wasn't just for the prophets in the Old Testament and the New. And it's not just for pastors or missionaries or who you would deem the holy or super-Christians of today. But it does bring about a question, this call that God places on each of our lives. For every believer, it's a question that I think we have to continue to ask of ourselves, especially as we look into Acts chapter 25 together today. This is the question that we have to ask. Is it worth it to you to follow Jesus Christ with your whole life? Not is it worth it, because the answer to that is obviously obviously yes. It is worth it to follow Jesus with your whole life. But my question is personalized, asking you, is it worth it to you to live your whole life for Christ? The obvious church answer is a resounding yes, but I want for us to genuinely consider Remember the gravity and the weight of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. I want for us to acknowledge the seriousness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe we've heard it so often that it's become something that we don't quite remember the weight of what it meant. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God would come into the world and become flesh and then sacrifice his life, give his life in order for us to be redeemed by his grace, saved by grace through faith in him, the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And so the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel message, is an eternal one. It's of eternal consequence. It is an eternal matter. And so we see Paul here defending himself again, being put on trial yet again, sharing this gospel of Jesus Christ. Defending himself is not simply against false accusations that are being laid out against him, but as he shares his defense, he makes clear the message of Jesus Christ an eternal matter. And that's what we're going to talk about together today. Let's pray before we get into the word. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person who is here, everyone who is joining us online. God, we thank you that your word is readily available to us. God, I thank you. I'm humbled that you would call me to be a pastor and you charge me to handle your word responsibly. And so, God, I pray that as I preach your word, not mine, that you would empower me through your Holy Spirit. Speak through me. And may every person who is listening May you be working in their hearts as well through the power of that same Holy Spirit that we come to know you more, that we take our faith more seriously than perhaps we have, and that we would grow to know what it means to live for you completely with our whole lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to look at two things to consider as we share the message of Jesus Christ. The first thing is this, that there is a need for devotion to God. A need for devotion to God. And then secondly, we're going to look that there's an eternal significance 
of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is an eternal significance to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to start with that first point here, the need for devotion to God. Let's look at verse 1 together. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea, and the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking a favor, as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was kept at Caesarea, and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there's anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? So we're talking about the need for devotion to God. Now, every person in this world is devoted, is a devoted person. Every person in this world has devotion. Devotion, again, is defined as love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or a cause. The question is then, who or what are you devoted to? We know that this question, the answer to this question, essentially is who or what is your motivation for life, for the day? Who or what are you truly living for? I asked the question at the very beginning of the message. Is it worth it to you to follow Jesus Christ with your whole life? If you are truly devoted to him in your life, then the answer is yes, it is worth it to you. But this is what I'm going to say. No matter what you may answer with your lips, the true devotion that someone has will show through their actions. And we see a lot of devotion here actually on part of the Jewish rulers, right? They're devoted to stopping Paul. They're devoted to keeping their own power. And what they tried already with Felix, who has now lost his position, and now Porcius Festus comes, and they're still doing the same thing. I'm telling you right now, understand that the enemy of God is devoted as well. They're devoted against you. They're devoted against God. And largely, most often, because they are fully devoted to themselves, their own glory, their own power, their own selfish desires. But they claim to be devoted to God. These are the Jewish rulers. They're the ones who are supposed to be teaching the scripture to everyone. With their lips, they say, this is for God's sake. But with their actions, you see the pride you see that their devotion is to themselves. If they were devoted to God, they would not plan to kill, violating the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. They would not bear false witness against Paul, violating the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness, sorry, violating the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, and the ninth commandment, to not bear false witness. So with their mouths, they say they're devoted to God. And they try to cover up their lives in righteousness by their fasting and praying and doing all these outward actions, yes. But what we see truly happening right now as they accuse Paul and try to get him killed, even have a plan to ambush and murder him, they do not have true devotion to God because it, it lacks a genuine relationship with him because they have rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Being devoted to themselves, you'll notice that the word favor comes up a lot. They're asking of favors. You do this for me, I'll do this for you. They ask the Roman authorities, try to ingratiate themselves to them. Say, look, if you deliver Paul to us, then we'll make sure we help keep the peace so that you can continue to look good before Caesar. 
that you're doing a good job keeping the peace in the temple and in the Jewish community. And they tried this once with Felix, and he lost his job. Now Portius Festus is here. They continue to do so. Their devotion shows through to themselves. They need to get rid of Paul. They had nothing legitimate to accuse Paul of. But it works both ways within this interaction. Remember, Felix, he was devoted to staying in power. And even though he lost his power before he stepped away, as a favor to the Jewish leaders, he kept Paul in prison. So listen to what's happened. Felix found nothing wrong that Paul had done against the Roman authorities, against the Roman government. But as a favor to the Jews, because of his own devotion to himself, his own power, he's left now the Apostle Paul in jail. And this is when Festus, Portius Festus comes in. So they're doing the same thing again. It's like deja vu. And Festus is no different than Felix. He knows that if he's going to look good before Caesar, then he doesn't want any unrest. He doesn't want any trouble or conflict to occur within the Jewish leadership. He wants to curry their favor. He doesn't care about the religion or about their power as long as it looks good on him. His own power helps him to keep his status. So if he can do them a favor, then they'll help keep the peace in the area that he's been given to govern. Less trouble and headache for Festus if the Jewish leaders are happy. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. But Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. So if Paul had agreed to go to Jerusalem... Unbeknownst to him, there was a plot to ambush and kill him. So we see again the sovereign hand of God at work here, even in the decisions that Paul is making. He surely would have been murdered en route to Jerusalem. But Paul appeals to Caesar. He wants to see Caesar. He says if he's done anything that's punishable by death, then by all means he will receive that judgment. And so we see the devotion that the Jewish leaders have to their own power. We see the devotion that Festus has to his own power. But to Paul, we see his utter devotion to Christ Jesus. That even in the face of death, he's willing to say that I will not compromise. I will not be wayward. I'm going to follow Jesus, speak truth, because I know who he is. And I know that he is worth living for with my whole life. Being devoted to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Paul has no fear of death. In fact, he went to Jerusalem the first time, returning there knowing he could very well die. God kept him alive and kept his sovereign hand over Paul, as we've learned. The reality of death has no hold on Paul. He does not have fear. He does not have anxiety. He does not have worry. Why? Because he's fully devoted to Jesus Christ. He's all in with his life. He knows the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has changed him, who was once a child of the enemy, and now he is called a child of God. Who was once serving devotion to himself, now devoted fully to Jesus. He's quite sure if he were to be killed, exactly where he would go, exactly where he would be, exactly who he would be with. God, the Father, who sent the Son to come into the world, that whoever believes in him as he died on the cross, as he bled on the cross for us, that whoever believes in him will be forgiven, shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so Paul shows his devotion, even to the point of death, to Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior. Now I want to ask you again in a personal way. Do you find yourself scheming and planning your life all around what you can get for yourself? 
and for what you want in life? Do you find yourself daydreaming about what could be for your life, the success that you want in your life, the type of family you want in your life, how many kids you want to have in your life, making money with your life, whatever it might be. Do you find yourself scheming and planning and daydreaming, and is it always or usually around what you can get for yourself and making yourself greater in this world? Let me ask you another question. Are you compromising in your obedience to God in any way? Justifying it because it allows you to get and keep what you want. Has your devotion to yourself outgrown or overshadowed your devotion to God and obedience to Him? Maybe it's a habitual sin that you've kept hidden, but God sees, He knows. Maybe it's a relationship that you know you should not be in. Maybe it's cutting corners and cheating in order to get or stay ahead at your workplace or in school. Maybe it's actually a good thing that you're devoted to. You're devoted to your family, and that's a great thing, but perhaps your devotion to your family has taken priority to your true devotion that you ought to have to Jesus Christ first and foremost, maybe with your family, you've been letting things slide or compromising in being obedient to God, taking sin less seriously with your loved ones because your devotion to them has overtaken your devotion that should be for God first and foremost. You're willing to give them a pass. You're justifying things. Well, it's my family. It's, it's my wife. It's my husband. It's, it's my children, whatever it might be. And God is calling you to see the need for true devotion to God. Him first. No one else. Nothing else. Obeying God is more important than you furthering your career Obeying God, following Him, obeying Him, being devoted to Him is far greater than looking good before other people. Because it's an eternal matter who you are devoted to. It's an eternal matter with significant consequences, though you may not see it in your heart, in your life. That is the truth of the matter. And so all of us, all of us, myself included, we must learn to repent and ask God to give us a heart that is fully devoted to him and ask of him to show in your heart what are the things that have been appealing to your devotion in such a way that your devotion has been spread out, that your devotion to God has taken second place, that it's been put on the back burner, and one way to check that in a very practical way is this. Now, I know that you can't do it hour for hour because we work. A lot of us, we work. And so you can't say, well, if I work 40, 50 hours a week, then I need to read the Bible for 40, 50 hours a week. That's just not how it works. But a practical way to look at it is where do you find yourself spending your time? And what do you find yourself doing with your free time? Do you go to God in prayer? Do you read the Bible? Do you have a true devotion to God? And here's the thing. You can be a genuine believer of Jesus Christ, but lack in your devotion to him. But God doesn't want lukewarm Christianity. He wants us to seek him fervently, earnestly. He wants those who are worshiping in spirit and in truth. So again, I ask you, are you living your life devoted to Jesus Christ? And if you're not, he does not condemn you. He does not say, what's wrong with you? Don't you know that I died for you? No, he says, look, I've paid the price already. I've made it possible for you to be a child of mine. Now, as my child, live with devotion to me. So please, I ask of you, be honest. 
Look deeply into your heart. See where your devotions lie. And if it's not for God, first and foremost in your life, repent and turn to him. Second thing is this, the eternal significance of the resurrection. We're going to start reading from verse 13. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There's a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. Verse 17, so when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accuser stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So we've already seen enough that there's no case against Paul. Okay, that's... As Paul tells the truth about his stay in Jerusalem and what he's been doing, he has not incited any riots against Rome. He has not caused civil unrest. He has not done any of the things that he is being accused of. And still yet, he has to stand trial again. He's been imprisoned wrongfully for all this time to please the Jewish leaders. So Festus is just, it's, it's, a, it's a broken record, it's the same thing. Well, we haven't found anything on this guy, but he's been in prison, but there's this case that the Jewish leadership are bringing up again, so I couldn't figure out what to do, so I'm bringing it to you. And interestingly enough, this Agrippa is the great-grandson of Herod the Great. And you might know Herod the Great was the one who tried to kill baby Jesus in order to keep power for himself. And so yet another Example of one who is devoted to his own power, himself, his own status, so much so that he was willing to kill the babies, Jewish babies, baby boys, simply to keep control and power for himself. And so this is the great-grandson of that Herod the Great. And so now a couple generations later, here is King Agrippa II holding a trial against a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul has admitted to one thing, that he is, in fact, a leader of the way, the way of Jesus Christ, that he is a leader of the Christian people and the Jews who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But again, he's had nothing to do with any of the other things that he has been accused of. And so one interesting thing that I want to focus in on here as Festus is telling Agrippa, King Ab Agrippa, what's happening is this in verse 18 to 19. Because it speaks volumes about how Festus views not only the dispute that's at hand, but also what the resurrection means. So verse 18, when the accuser stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. It's as if Festus was saying, well, he didn't really do anything against us, against Rome, so there weren't any real evils that I thought maybe that they were talking about because they want him dead. But I didn't say anything there, and that's the most important thing for us as a Roman authority. This is probably what he's saying, what he's thinking. In fact, it's just a religious argument that Paul's having with this Jewish council about this Jesus guy. He died, and the Jewish rulers are saying he's dead, but Paul is saying, no, he's not dead, he's alive. And he's saying, I didn't know what to do, so I'm bringing this to you, wise King Agrippa. 
So to Festus, this is just a religious dispute. Perhaps it's not something of grave consequence to him because what he cares about is the Roman government. That's what he stands for. That's what he cares about. And he says, according to that, there haven't been any evils that he's committed like I thought he might have. And so people argue over all sorts of things, don't they? Who here has had a dispute with someone about something before? Right? Okay, I saw mostly married couples raising their hands, right? <laughs> no. But we've all had disputes of different sorts. And I remember a time long ago when you had a dispute with your friend about a certain fact, you couldn't just pull out your phone and Google it to see who's correct, right? You'd have to be like, oh, you want to bet? And then you'd have to go find an encyclopedia or figure out some kind of other magazine or resource to prove that you were the one who's correct. But oftentimes what happened was you'd make a bet over a dispute and you might just forget about it. You had an argument, a dispute about some fact, but it wasn't important enough, and so you ended up forgetting about that bet. It wasn't of grave consequence. People argue about all sorts of things, have dispute about all sorts of dumb things. They argue about who's the greatest of all time in basketball. I mean, that one might not be a great example because it is Michael Jordan, it is not LeBron James. But there is argument, debate over all sorts of things. Do you put the toilet paper where it rolls over when you pull it out or under when you pull it out? iPhone, Android, what's better? These are the disputes that are clearly inconsequential. Both people in the dispute can believe what they want to believe, and it's not going to affect them greatly in their lives. It's not a matter of life or Death. And that's how Festus kind of sees this dispute about this guy named Jesus that the Jewish leaders are saying he's dead, but Paul is saying that he's alive. But as believers of Jesus Christ, we know that this dispute, that this matter at hand, is not just some inconsequential religious argument. It's not just some kind of inconsequential dispute. In fact, the answer to this dispute has eternal significance. The eternity of humanity, what happens, rests on the answer to this dispute. Is Jesus Christ still dead or is he alive? Was the resurrection real? And so it's acknowledged that Jesus Christ did, in fact, die on the cross. That's a fact. There was someone named Jesus. He did live his life, and he did give it upon the cross, and he died. But did he stay dead? Was he still dead, or was Jesus alive, as Paul attests to? Was Jesus alive as the many disciples who saw him after he had risen again on the third day would attest to all the people who have devoted themselves fully to Jesus Christ, who have been saved by grace through faith, that they would attest that Jesus is, in fact, risen. Everything hangs on the answer to this dispute. Is Jesus alive or is he still dead? You know, I think... We can look to the scripture for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 to 19, I want you to see these words and hear them. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misinterpreting and misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In Christ, we have hope in this life only. We are of all people most to be pitied. 
So what's Paul talking about here in his letter to the Corinthian believers? He's saying, if Jesus Christ is not still alive, if he was not raised from the dead, then what I'm doing right now up here makes me the biggest fool. Because I'm preaching about this Jesus. I'm preaching about this gospel. But if there was no resurrection, please stop listening to anything that I have to say because it is foolishness. Even your faith is in vain if Jesus Christ, in fact, was not resurrected. If Jesus did not come back to life, if he was not raised, then those of us who have placed our faith in him, well, we're stupid, we're fools. And the world ought to laugh at us. But look, it makes sense that the world is more like Festus, doesn't it? The world may hear the message of the resurrected Jesus Christ and think of it as a myth or a fairy tale. They may argue that it's simply impossible for someone who's been dead for days to be brought back to life. Maybe if it's CPR or doing something like that immediately on scene, but someone who's literally dead, all systems down, to be raised back to life, that it's impossible. They may even argue that, well, if you're a Christian, okay, I respect what you, what you want to believe. You believe that to be true, but not everyone has to do what you do. Not everyone has to believe what you believe. What's true for you may not be true for me. That's what the world thinks when they hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, they might say, look, I respect that that's what you believe, but you don't need to try to push that on me. Stop trying to push your beliefs on me. That's oftentimes what people will say. Because what they don't understand is that the answer to this dispute is of eternal consequence, eternal significance. If you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the risen Lord and Savior, your eternity becomes secure in him. By grace through faith, you are saved. You're promised a hope that cannot be taken away from you. So though the world may think in such a way, as believers we know Christ crucified, Christ resurrected for you and for me. I mean, you hear some in the world even at least look positively on Jesus and his teachings about love and forgiveness, but we know that God gives us his word. He gave to us his son, not just so we could become more moral people, not so that we can just become better citizens, not just so that we can become people who are kind and good. No, it's because we needed a, a reestablishment of relationship that was broken because of sin. And so in his death, when he said it is finished, in his resurrection, when he defeated our sin showed victory once and for all over death, it is absolutely enormous, eternal weight. This is an eternal matter. So I want to ask you before we close, is the gospel of Jesus Christ, is his resurrection the truth of who Jesus Christ is and what he did for you upon the cross and his death and resurrection, is it still a big deal for you in your life? Is the gospel still a big deal for you in your life? As you live your life right now, go to work tomorrow, as you're with your friends, with your family, is the gospel of Jesus Christ at the forefront of your heart devotion? Is it affecting the way that you live? Is it affecting the way that you treat others? Is it affecting you? I hope and pray that it's still a big deal. That the gospel, the resurrection, doesn't just become a footnote in your faith. Oh yeah, that's what I believe about Jesus. Yeah, he, he rose again. Oh yeah, he was resurrected. Yeah, I believe in that. But that we would look at it and say, Jesus is alive. He's resurrected. The resurrection was real. And because I know that, my life is not the same anymore. My purpose, my devotion is for Christ alone. And I want the whole world to know it. I don't want there to be any person that looks at this and thinks that it is not of consequence. 
I want people to know my Lord and Savior, who is alive, sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And so let's be a church of people who is fully devoted to God, fully devoted with our whole lives. No other devotion comes close to our devotion that we have for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's be a church of people that remembers every day the significance, the eternal matter of hope and salvation that comes through the message of Jesus. And there's a great promise for those of us who are called, a great promise for us as we live for him. Let's pray together. Could we just take a moment to respond in prayer? Where is your devotion? Where is your devotion? Who are you living for? You being here right now in this sanctuary listening to God's word online, God wants you to recognize that this is a moment right now that you can pray and say, God, remind me that this is an eternal matter. Thank you for securing my eternity. Help me to fulfill the call to now make this known to the ends of the earth. And maybe that's not what your life has been about. And that's okay. God is gracious. He forgives. But he wants you to live for him. He wants you to know the depths of his grace and his love and his righteousness. So can we just take a moment right now before I close this in prayer. If God is moving in your heart right now, devote yourself again. Recommit to living your life for this eternal matter. Maybe you've been living for the things that you know will fade away, that you'll have for a time. But live for the eternal things, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the call that he's placed in your life. Just take one moment to commit yourselves to that. Devote yourself to God. And then I'll close us in prayer before we go into a time of worship through giving. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace that covers over us. God, we repent because too often our devotion to you falls to the wayside. We forget the enormous weight and significance of what you did for us upon the cross. And we start living for ourselves. We start devoting ourselves to things that better us, better for me, better for my family, better for my friends, better for my success, and all these different things. And God, you remind us graciously that our fullest devotion must be for you. So God, I pray that we would not take disobedience to your word lightly. That if there's any way in our hearts that is against you, that we would repent and that we would ask of you for strength to obey, even when it's hard. And God, we pray again, thanking you for the work upon the cross that Jesus Christ did, the only way that we could have the hope of salvation through his death and resurrection. We are your people. We are your children by your grace. Help us to live with this eternal matter on our minds and on our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.